This is session six in our Understanding the End Times class. And the title of this session is Daniel's 70-Week Prophecy. Session six, Daniel's 70-Week Prophecy. And I want to encourage you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. I'm going I'm to start by reading that scripture. Matthew 24, verse 15. And uh, as I'm trying to get there, just you're, I'm sure, as well. But Matthew 24, and I I went through a really a painstaking, painstaking amount of detail to tell you Matthew 24 was not fulfilled in 70 AD. I'm not going to rehash that here. Just to say that Matthew 24 is about the future. Matthew 24 was not fulfilled in 70 AD. Um, I, I gave a lot of examples of why that's the case. But in Matthew 24, verse 15, the the disciples had asked a question back in verse 1. Tell us, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus gives them a bunch of answers. And he comes down now to verse 15. And I I want to read this to us. I want you to read along with me. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place... And here, Matthew, who's writing down this gospel, puts into parentheses, let the reader understand. What Matthew is saying here is he's telling the reader, he's telling us who would read this, it's so important for you to understand what Daniel is speaking about here because the Lord says this is one of the key sign events for the end of the age. Amen. Let the reader understand. Here's what what Matthew, as an apostle, is giving a commandment to us here, Gentile, the Gentile church. Matthew is giving us an apostolic commandment. The reader, that would include us, that would be us. You must understand. And especially to the church... Who lives at the end of the age? Which we do. We don't know when exactly Jesus is coming back. We live at the end of the age. And so Matthew is saying to us, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, let the reader understand. In other words, Matthew is telling us, you need to understand the book of Daniel. Can I get an amen? We need to understand the book of Daniel. And to be honest with you, I was thinking about it this morning. I'm always trying to think about, okay, what's the best way I can get people engaged in this? Because there are certain messages people are are really interested in. There are certain ones people may not be interested. But I was thinking about this. Here's what I was thinking. If I was to tell you that I had an encounter with the angel Gabriel and he gave me a prophecy for the nation of America, I promise you everyone in this audience and everyone online and everyone would would absolutely be all ears. There would be no zoning out. There would be, your attention would be laser focused. However, if I tell you I'm going to talk about an encounter that Daniel had with the angel Gabriel that's written in scripture, that's not about America, but it's about Israel, what happens? The attention goes way down. See, that, I think that's hitting on something. Is the, in, in the church, especially in the charismatic church, we are very much more focused on present day, modern day prophecy. What are the, the modern day prophets saying? Because, I mean, you know, we want to hear, okay, what's the Lord saying right now? Then we are in what the prophets have already said. Amen? I think that's an issue. And so I want to encourage us. And if, and if I was to talk about America, we would be all ears. But now I'm going to mention about Israel. See, there's this tendency to kind of zone out and say, well, that doesn't really apply to me. And, you know, some people have been talking about Christian nationalism. And uh, during the election cycle, a lot of the church was talking about Christian nationalism there were some things I, I thought people were saying that were right and some things I didn't agree with. But the, the idea of Christian nationalism is the idea that you put your nation at the center of the kingdom of God. 
For like we, us living in America, we think everything in the kingdom of God revolves around America. And so anything that would come out into a different nation or whatever, you know, Israel, for example, or another nation, we might not have that same level of interest, right? And so I think that we need to be kingdom-focused people who put the kingdom of God above our own national interest. Amen. Thank you. I, someone's awake. So, amen. And so we're going to spend some time right now looking at the book of Daniel. And, you know, even as we are right now in the church, I'm going to read a scripture here. Well, I, I'm just going to paraphrase it just for the sake of time. Is in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul was writing and he says, The church is is built upon the foundation of the prophets and the apostles, with Jesus Christ being the cornerstone. And I used to go back in college, college and after co actually after college, I used to go to a Pentecostal church, and they would always teach that scripture to mean that God builds the church on the foundation of modern-day apostles and modern-day prophets. <laughs> That's not what that means at all. What Paul is saying is the church of Jesus Christ is is built upon the foundation of the prophets. I was talking about the Old Testament prophets and the foundation of the 12 apostles plus Paul and Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. I believe one of the reasons we're seeing the church in America, the church in this nation shaking like it is, is because we've built upon the wrong foundation. We've built upon a foundation other than Jesus Christ We've built upon a foundation other than the Old Testament prophets. We've built upon a foundation other than the 12 apostles and Paul. And so God wants to get the church back to the right foundations that we would come back to the, the foundations of the church because if the foundations are not proper, the whole house is going to crumble. Amen. So anyway, having said all of that, we're going to spend some time in this session and in the next session talking about the book of Daniel. And so, I, you know, Daniel... You know, you know, we're seeing right now in this nation is where we have seen the failed Trump prophecies. I don't know who counts these, but someone counted that there were 40 failed Trump prophecies. I don't know if that's accurate or not. But the point is, is the whole church and the world has looked to the, the modern day prophetic and said that this is going to happen and it didn't. And so a lot of the church is like, I never want to hear another dream, another vision or whatever. Now, what we need to do is not despise prophetic utterance, but I think it points to something here is we need to build our foundation not on modern day prophecy. We still need modern day prophecy, but not to build the foundation on. We need to build our foundation on the prophets whose word is tried and true and tested and has been found infallible. Amen. And so Daniel Daniel, this, this is what's so powerful. Daniel was so stunningly, got it, stunningly accurate in his, prophet, in his prophesying that he wrote, he wrote these prophecies in 537 B.C. And modern day critics were like, he's so accurate. He must have really written this in the second century after Babylonian Empire and the Media Persian Empire and the Greek Empire and the Roman Empire. There's no way someone could be this accurate. The critics were like, he had to have written this in the second century. But that's not true. That's not true. He wrote it in 537 B.C. And so if we're going to understand the book of Daniel, here I'm going to give you the key. The, this is the key to understanding the book of Daniel. I'm going to read it in the notes here. What we are going to see, this is the key to interpreting the book of Daniel, and it's actually the key to interpreting much of the book of Revelation, Matthew 24, and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, is what you will see is God has a six-fold purpose for the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. This is accomplished during a timetable of 490 years, and this purpose is executed by four worldwide empires that God uses to refine, purify, purge, prepare, and judge Israel and the Jewish people. But again, this is not only related to Israel. This is related to you. 
What God is going to do that's Jerusalem-centric, by the way, end-time prophecy is not America-centric. It's Jerusalem-centric. It flows out of what God's going to do in the nation of Israel and in Jerusalem in particular. That flows out of that. But I want to tell you, this is very relevant to you. Matthew was saying, let the reader understand. And so I'm going to, um, we're going to go through right now this key to understanding the book of Daniel, much of Revelation, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Matthew 24, much of end time prophecy hinges on these scriptures. So let's go ahead and we'll, if you have your Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter 9. And I want to encourage you as, as we're turning here to read the book of Daniel. I believe it's a book the Lord is highlighting at this moment to his people. Uh, read the book of Daniel. Read especially chapter 2, chapter 7, and Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Read these, these scriptures. But we're going to start here in, in, Matt, in uh, Daniel 9, 24. Is Daniel is, just to give you a context for Daniel chapter 9, what's happened, Daniel has been in Babylonian captivity for almost 70 years. It's probably coming at the very end of the 70th year, coming somewhere in there. Nebuchadnezzar has taken the Jewish people. He's destroyed Israel. He's destroyed the temple. He's destroyed Jerusalem. He's taken the, the Jewish people captive into Babylon. They've been there for almost 70 years. Daniel is now in prayer. He's in intercession. He's crying out to God based on the Jewish people, based on the prophecy of Jeremiah, where Jeremiah said, 70 years have been decreed for your people. And he's saying, God, now is the time to send the people of Israel back to their land, back to, the, to Israel, back to Jerusalem, and rebuild the temple. And in the middle of this prayer, Daniel has a visitation from the angel Gabriel. And now, here we come in verse 24. The, the angel Gabriel tells Daniel, 70 weeks have been decreed, notice this, for your people, the Jewish people, and your holy city, Jerusalem. This, scholars refer to Daniel 9, 24 to 27 as the backbone of all end time prophecy. And I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. It is the backbone, it is the framework of all end time prophecy. And, and it is Jerusalem-centric. It revolves around the city of Jerusalem. And now Gabriel says to finish the transgression, and here's what we're going to see now. There are actually six purposes for this prophecy. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Verse 25. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress, Verse 26, then after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. Verse 27, and he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a, a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate. I want you to notice that language right there. On the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate. In other words, Jesus said the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet is the catalytic event that launches the great tribulation He's referring to Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Notice the language. On, a, on the wing of abomination will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. That's a lot of information. We're going to break it down here. But here's what 
here's what Jesus was saying. The abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet is the event that triggers the great tribulation, the last three and a half years of the age. And Matthew is telling us, if you're reading my gospel, you really need to understand the book of Daniel. You, it's vital we understand the book of Daniel. And specifically, this scripture in 24 through 27. So we're going to go into great detail now about that. And so when we first read this scripture, we're like, okay, 70 weeks have been determined for your people. Okay, what does that mean? I mean, what does that mean? 70 weeks, does that mean literally seven, 70 weeks? Or what exactly does it mean? If you drill into the Hebrew, what you find out is that this Hebrew word for weeks can either, is, a, is a period of seven. It's a period of seven days or a period of seven years. Make sense? And so even, even in a scripture you might want to write down, Genesis 29, 27, is we see that Hebrew word used when Laban is, makes Jacob serve for seven more years Laban says to Jacob, complete the week. It's the same word used in Daniel 9, 24 to 27, complete the week. And if you read through there, you understand it is a period of seven years. And so I'll just make the long story short. Most scholars who read Daniel 9, 24 to 27 understand this period of weeks, 70 weeks are actually 70 periods of seven years. Make sense? 70 periods of seven years. 490 years. Here's an interesting fact for you. When Peter came up to Jesus and he said, Lord, how often should we forgive our brother? And the Lord said, you should forgive him up to 70 times seven. He's actually referring to this prophecy. He's actually saying Daniel's 70 weeks are a time of great grace and mercy for the Jewish people. Now, that doesn't mean we, we should always forgive, for sure. But Jesus was making explicit reference to Daniel's prophecy. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? So Daniel says 70 seven-year periods are decreed for your people. Okay, why did God pick 70? Why did God pick 70? Well, to us Gentiles who are reading this, we're like, okay, 70, what is the, what's the significance of 70? Well, in the law, in the Torah, the Shemitah, year, the, the Shemitah sabbatical year was the time when Israel would, would say, we're going to take an entire year off from our land. We're going to let it go dormant. We're going to allow it not to produce fruit. We're going to allow it to, to grow over, and we're just going to give it the land rest. And so what happened was, the Jewish people most likely, there's a couple scriptures in the notes, most likely the Jewish people for 70, they missed over you know, 70 or 70 more, 70 plus Sabbath years. And now the Lord was saying, because you've missed those 70 Sabbath years, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you 70 years of captivity in Babylon. And I'm going to take that, I'm going to take that, and I'm going to use 70 times seven, which is the Sabbath year, I'm going to use that to bring 490 years that I'm going to do a divine work in Israel. Yeah, I saw a little puzzled look. Makes sense so far? 490 years. So we can summarize it like this, is we can say the angel Gabriel told Daniel 490 years have been decreed for the nation of Israel and for the city of Jerusalem to accomplish a sixfold purpose. So I'm just going to quickly go through that purpose. It's um, in, Math, in Daniel 9.24, to finish the transgression and make an end to sin. What, what the Lord is saying this is I'm going to use these 490 years in the nation of Israel to bring the, the rebellion of the Jewish people and the nation of Israel, I'm going to bring it to an end. I'm going to bring their rebellion. I'm going to bring their iniquity. I'm going to bring their sin to a complete end over this time period. 
And then, you know, it, it, I, I quoted the scripture, but in Isaiah 4.4, 4, it talks about God is going to release into the nation of Israel the spirit of, ju the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning to purify Israel. And we'll see it at the end of the age when Jacob's trouble comes to, that, to the nation of Israel. God is going to bring uh, fire and judgment to the nation of Israel to purify them of sin. The next thing we see is to make atonement for iniquity. Uh, there's no doubt about what that means. That means the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross. What God was saying is during this 490-year time period, I am going to put the Messiah on the cross, and I'm going to bring atonement for the sins of Israel and the Jewish people and for the entire world. I'm going to make atonement for iniquity. The next part is to bring in everlasting righteousness. See, part of this divine working of God is so that ultimately God's righteousness would come to Jerusalem. And there's, there's several scriptures in the notes I list, but we, you know, it says, I have appointed watchmen on the wall. Day and night they're going to keep crying out to make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Her righteousness is going to go forth like brightness into the nations. God is going to move at the end of the age uh, around the world, but especially from the nation of Israel as the epicenter of all that God does to bring in everlasting righteousness to that city. And that city will become the praise of the earth and the righteousness of God when Jesus comes back will be fulfilled out of Jerusalem. Make sense so far? To seal up vision and prophecy. What Daniel's saying right here, or what Gabriel's saying right here, is that God is going to use these 490 years to bring all that has been written in the prophets, Daniel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Malachi, Joel. God is going to use these 490 years to bring to completion, to seal up vision and prophecy, to fulfill all the prophetic scriptures that have been written. And we see the very same thing in Acts 3.21 when Peter stands up and he says, he says, Jesus Christ is restrained in heaven to come back until the times of restoration which were spoken of by the prophets. He's talking about the Old Testament prophets. So it's the same thing right there. The, the final thing here is to anoint the most holy place. And that's going to talk, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, it's in the notes, but that's talking about the millennial temple that Jesus will rule and reign from, that his glory will go out into the nations. So the question is, when exactly did Daniel's 70-week prophecy, or to say it another way, when exactly did this, did this divine timetable of 490 years, when did it begin? That's a, that's a big, important question. And I want to show you this. When we go through this, you're going to see a stunning, I said it again, I do say it a lot. You're going to see a stunning revelation that this prophecy not only predicts the Messiah's coming, but this prophecy actually tells us the exact time when he would appear on earth. This should become part of our evangelistic strategy when we're telling unbelievers that Jesus is the Messiah. There, it was actually written 500 plus years in advance when the Messiah would come on the earth, when he would die. It tells us exactly when that would happen. America hasn't even been a nation. We've only been a nation for 244 years. 500 plus years, Daniel is told the exact timing when that will happen. And this prophecy tells us when. I'm going to go through, through it here in a minute. You still with me? Processing? You there? You seem awfully quiet today. Raise your hand. Just let me feel better. All right. You haven't zoned out. Okay. Here's what Gabriel tells Daniel. He says, you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree, this is verse 25, the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again even with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. So what we know here, this, I'm just going to make it real simple, 
is there's seven weeks and there's 62 weeks. Really what that means is there's 69 weeks. It's kind of a confusing way of saying 69 weeks, but there's 69 weeks times seven equals 483 years. Okay, I go through it in my notes, but the, the, the decree is specifically related to rebuilding Jerusalem. Okay? It's not about rebuilding the temple. There's a decree given by Cyrus to rebuild the temple, but there's, there's a, a decree given in 440 BC, 444 B.C. by Artaxerxes that is a decree to rebuild the, the city of Jerusalem. And so it's that decree... 444 B.C., when the prophecy of Daniel begins to tick down. That's when this prophecy begins. And so, if you're looking here on our chart here, there, there should be a chart. Hopefully you can read it. If you can't, there's notes in here. But beginning in 40, 444 B.C., there was a, an edict given by Artaxerxes to go and rebuild Jerusalem. And you can read about it in the book of Nehemiah. And so there's actually, from that decree, there are 69 weeks until Messiah the Prince, until he comes. That means when that decree came in 444 B.C. and Messiah the Prince came, there's 483 years. All right, so I want you, especially if you don't like math, slap yourself on the cheeks a couple times. because I'm going to do a little bit of nerdy math here, all right? So... I am a math geek, and I know we have a few math nerds in here. I think this is so fascinating, but I know there's a lot of people that are like, oh, God, don't talk about math. Okay, it's really amazing when you see this, all right? And then we're going to show a slide to, to talk about it. But just don't zone out, all right? Don't zone out. It's actually really fascinating to see the exact prediction 500 years plus in advance of when Jesus the Messiah would come and he would die on the cross for our sins. So the, the slide, uh, the calculation of Daniel's 69 weeks. Okay, you got 69 weeks. Remember, there's seven years per week. You with me so far? That gives you 483 biblical years because uh, we're, we're, the Lord is talking in biblical years in this prophecy. Okay, I am not going to take the time to go through this, but it's in the notes. If you look at a certain scriptures that are in the notes, you see there that a biblical month is 30 days in a month. And so you take that by 12, 483 biblical years times 360 biblical days per year gives you, are you ready for this? You there, Heather? Yeah, you like this? Okay. Awesome. Anna, is you paying attention back there? This is, this is cool stuff. This is math made fun. 173,888 biblical days. So, so I see Randall's like real curious. He's probably saying, well, you got a math error in your calculation. But So now what we have to do is given that 444 B.C. is in the Gregorian calendar or in solar years, we have to take the biblical days and convert that to solar years. All right? Next slide, Daniel's 69 weeks to solar years. Divided by 365 point whatever, da 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 gives you, it, it equates to 476 solar years plus about 25 solar days. You with me? You with me? It's, it's just so easy. Yes. Here's what's amazing. Next slide. Rebuild Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince. What's so amazing here is the decree given in 444 B.C. And you add in there 476 solar years plus 25 solar days. It brings you to March the 30th, 33 A.D. And uh, there's a book, probably the only one that will be interested in this might be my dad but it's called The Chronological Aspects of the Life of Christ, and it goes through why Jesus, the triumphal entry, began on, the, on March the 30th, 33 A.D., why Jesus was crucified April 3rd, 33 A.D. Here's the big takeaway. Okay, come back to me. Slap your cheeks. 
The, the big takeaway is the word of God 500 years in advance not only tells us Messiah the Prince is coming, it tells us precisely, precisely when he's going to come. Isn't that amazing? That's stunning. You don't seem that excited. I, that's an amazing, amazing reality. Not only that, not only that, but you read in, uh, you, you read down in um, verse Daniel 9, verse 26. After 62 weeks, so after that 69-week period, that 483-week period, after that, that period of 483 years, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. Now, if you go into the Hebrew, what that actually means is the Messiah will cut a covenant and will die. That's pretty awesome. The Lord is telling us that far in advance, the Messiah is coming to cut a covenant. And that covenant will mean the death of the Messiah, but it will be for the salvation of Israel and for all nations. And so we know, we know in perfect fulfillment that happened in 33 A.D., now, here we, here we need to understand. This is what I want you to grasp. So, so come back, grasp this. Is that, I want you to take note. This part of the prophecy was fulfilled. This is really going to be important in the next session. But I want you to, to hear it. Especially when we're going to identify the four empires that come against, that come against Israel. And it's going to help us un identify even the book of Revelation. Is these um, this part of the prophecy takes place when the Jews lived in Israel, when the, they occupied the city of Jerusalem, and they were performing sacrifices in the temple. That's real key that we'll need to understand when we go through, okay, who exactly are these four empires, and how will they be... This is going to be fulfilled in our day. I, in fact, I believe we're beginning to see the, the last empire being raised up right now, even as we speak. So, but in, when it comes to interpreting Bible prophecy, that is very important because it's, it's, that's the key to interpretation. It's, it's these, these things had to take place when the Jews were in Israel, they occupied Jerusalem, and they were performing temp, temple sacrifices. Now, what do we know right now? We know, and actually I'll get to that in a minute. So now let's go back down. You with me still? Okay. Not zoning out? Okay. Daniel 9, verse 26. It talks, this is, the, this is Daniel's last week. It's seven-year period. Or, or actually, let me take that back. That, that's not it. I haven't read that yet. Dan, that's in verse 27. Verse 26. The people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary... That's talking about the Roman army under General Titus that came into Israel in 70 AD and destroyed the temple, drove the Jews out of the land for over 1,800 years. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. And so we know in, in history from 66 AD to 135 AD, the, uh, the Roman army came and invaded the land of Israel and conquered the city of Jerusalem and drew, drove the Jewish people out of Israel for over 1,800 years. Now, in the, in the next verse, turn there to uh, Daniel 9, 27, is, is Daniel, or Gabriel, gives this, this, the explanation of Daniel's 70th week, or Daniel's last week, the last period of seven years, and he says, and he, and that refers back, I believe, to the prince who is to come, and he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering, and on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until the complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So the question we have now is who does he refer to? Because if you pick up a lot of commentaries or even books that will talk about this, 
people say he is referring to Jesus Christ. They're saying the covenant he's going to make with many is Jesus Christ. It's the new covenant he made. And he's, he's going to put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. Well, we see that in the book of Hebrews. You know, the temple sacrifices have come to an end. And so a lot of people claim the he in verse 27 is actually Jesus Christ. And I, mean, I find that that view is becoming a lot more popular today. But the problem with that, there's, there's several problems with that view and that interpretation. The first problem is that, that um, the first problem is if the weeks are years, then that would mean that covenant was only valid for seven years. So that's obviously not true. Some get around that and they go, well, you know, it could mean, it could symbolize eternal completion or it can symbolize that, you know, it's been completed. But you don't really have the luxury to change the meaning that, that is clearly revealed in the first part to what it means right now. You don't have the luxury to change that. And so, anyway, so I, I don't think at all that's what that's referring to. I think clearly what it's referring to, the people of the prince to come, verse 26, is talking about the Roman army coming in to destroy the temple in 70 AD, the people of the prince to come, the he is that prince to come, it's the Antichrist. And so what we're seeing here, verse 27, the last seven years of Daniel's 70-week prophecy is a seven-year period that begins when the Antichrist comes and signs a covenant with the nation of Israel, most likely the Arab world, and says, we're going to give peace in, in Israel. We're going to give peace to Jerusalem, and we're going to allow the Jewish people to build and rebuild their... Or actually, I think the temple will already be rebuilt by this time. We're going to sign a covenant that allows the Jewish people to uh, engage again in Levitical sacrifices. And I, I believe we're going to see that. You think about what's already happened. The nation of Israel restored in 1948 after 1,800 years of desolation. The Jewish people capturing Jerusalem in 1967. Making this prophecy. Remember what I said. This prophecy can, is related to the Jewish people living in the land, occupying Jerusalem. And what's the last thing that's left? Performing temple sacrifices. So when the Antichrist comes and signs this peace accord with Israel and the, and the Jewish people in the Arab world, it's going, to enable, it's going to enable the sacrifices to begin to resume. That is going to mean the 490-year prophecy is going to begin to tick again. Right now, it has been paused for over 1,800 years because Israel was not a nation. But we're moving, that's where I want us to get at. We are moving so quickly, so rapidly to the time when this prophecy is being fulfilled, even right before our eyes. Okay, so now let's go to the book of Revelation. I want you to, to see this prophecy. This prophecy is related to many different verses in the book of Revelation. It's interesting that if you want to understand, if you really want to understand the book of Revelation, you cannot understand the book of Revelation unless you understand the book of Daniel. In fact, you can't understand the book of Revelation unless you understand the Old Testament prophets. Isaiah, Joel, uh, Ezekiel especially, so much of what the Old Testament prophets uh, spoke about is carried into the book of Revelation. And so, you know, even when you come, when you come to Matthew chapter 13, or Revelation chapter 13, Revelation 17 and 18, that is basically carrying in what, Dan, what has been revealed to Daniel in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. And so the point is, if we want to understand the book of Revelation, we've got to understand the book of Daniel. So again, I encourage you, read the book of Daniel. Use these notes to kind of help you make sense of some of it, but read that book. Okay, so Revelation chapter 11. I'm going to just read some of these, some of these things just to give you an idea. Revelation 11. 
Verse 3. As I, I'm, going to, I'm going to grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. That 1260 days is three and a half years. It's the middle part of Daniel's set last week. So this is not just a random number that comes up that, why did God pick 1260 years? Well, it's going back to the prophecy in Daniel. And some people who over-allegorize the book of Revelation just get this all messed up. But no, it's, it's carrying over what has already been revealed to Daniel in, this, in, the, in that last week. And so in other words, this verse is telling us God is going to release, I believe it's Elijah and Moses, as two witnesses in, in the city of Jerusalem that will prophesy and be the, the messengers of God in the city of Jerusalem for three and a half years after the Antichrist has broken that covenant with Israel, he, after that happens, this last three and a half years, these two witnesses are going to prophesy in that city. Make sense? Now you go to Revelation 12, verse 6. And, and this is going to be very important when we get into the man-child and talking about the man-child and understanding the man-child. In Revelation 12, verse 6, it says, and we're going to, I'm not going to even talk about who the woman is. You might have questions. We'll get into that later. But when the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that there she would be nourished for 1,260 days. Again, that's not a random number. It is referring to the last half of Daniel's 70th week. In other words, God's saying, I'm going to provide protection during the reign of the Antichrist to the woman, and this woman will be divinely protected for three and a half years in the wilderness. Now we go to um, Revelation 12, 14. This helps you understand when you get to the book of Revelation. Okay, what exactly does all that mean? Because if you just see, why do they pick these 1,260 days and 42 months? And why do they pick this stuff? Well, it's coming straight out of the book of Daniel from this prophecy. But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman that she could fly into the wilderness to her place. That's really a rehashing of verse 6, where she was nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the presence of the serpent. That's actually, again, a direct quote from Daniel chapter 7. Times, time, or what is it? Uh, time, times, and half a time. That is the same thing as three and a half years. That's what the Lord is speaking. It's time, times, one year, times, two years, half a time, half a year. So it's the same, same thing repeated in this, in this kind of a different way. Uh, verse, uh, Revelation 13, verse 5. It's talking about the Antichrist. And it says, There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. Again, 42 months. It's three and a half years. It's the last half of Daniel's 70th week. God himself is going to give the Antichrist authority to act for 42 months. Okay? So let's just bring this down and just summarize real quick. This prophecy, Daniel 9, 24 through 27, is a vital prophecy to understand. It is, I, I can't even stress, if we are going to have any luck understanding the end times, the end of the age, the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, who the, the four empires are that we're going to talk about in the next session, who Revelation 17 and 18 is talking about, Revelation 13. If we're going to have any understanding of who these empires are, then this prophecy is so vital because God is revealing in this prophecy, he's revealing the sixfold purpose for the nation of Israel. He's revealing the divine timetable when he's going to act. He's revealing in there the, the four empires that God will use to refine, purify, judge, and prepare Israel for the reign of the Messiah. And he's telling us exactly what to look for. All right? Does that make sense? And so if we know with the certainty that how that prophecy was fulfilled in history, 
we know with absolute certainty, no question about it, there is coming in the future a seven-year period that I think could be very much closer than we think. I'm not saying like next year or anything like that. I, you know, maybe f 10 years perhaps. I don't know exactly. I don't know. I don't, none of us know. Um, you know, we asked in our end time class, when do you think Jesus is coming back? And uh, a lot of people said in the next, it was, I think we had 30 people that responded. A lot of people, probably the majority said in the, in the next 10 to 20 years, Others said 20 years or greater, but you know, no one knows when this is going to happen. But the point is, we know with certainty this is going to happen, and this is the backbone of all end time prophecy. So, just to close, prophecy is Jerusalem and Israel centric, not American centric, okay? As Americans, we need to get that out of our head. It's. <laughs> It is Jerusalem and Israel-centric. It is not America-centric. And so I'll just bring this to a close and say, um, read, take the, take the commandment of Matthew and read the book of Daniel. Read Daniel chapter 2. I mean, the whole book would be awesome, but Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, and Daniel chapter 9, especially those. You can read the whole book. That would be awesome. But especially those. And so in the next session, what we're going to do is we're going to look at using this key, which is the key that unlocks the mystery of the four empires, we're going to look at who these four empires are. Amen. Amen.